welcome. Welcome from the, from the east to west, north, south. We have representation from all corners around the world. My name is Jordi Pascual. I am the coordinator of the UCLG Culture Committee. In 2020, together with the city of Rome, we uh, approved a global statement, a global declaration on the right to participate in cultural life, the Rome Charter. And one of the activities we in the United Cities and local governments, the World Organization of Cities and Local Governments, one of the activities that we have committed to, to develop, to unfold, uh, is uh, the role of artistic creation, uh, artistic processes that are uh, fully uh, coherent, aligned, uh, converging, uh, diverging, uh, synchronized, uh, related in a nutshell with the Rome Charter, with the right to participate uh, fully and freely in cultural life, and with the obvious relation that this uh, right uh, has with the objective, with the uh, sustainable development goals, with the 17 objective, with the 17 uh, sustainable development Goals. Well, thank you, Jordi. I will just jump in to thank uh, all of you who are here. I mean, we have more than 15 cities who decided to accept this uh, uh, challenge and this uh, journey, and it's very exciting. I want to thank all the practitioners f that are th that are trying to explore this practice uh, to bring it into their own communities, and uh, this is very appreciated and very welcome. And I wanted to thank. Um, you know, every, every person that is working on this, and especially Daniel and Alan of Cooking Section that are with us and that are leading this process. And we are very happy to have you here and have you this journey with you. And of course, I want to thank the, the team of Orchestras of Transformation and the curators, uh, Judith Weilander, Matteo Lucchetti, Sara Alberani, Matteo Del Ballivo that are uh, leading this process and the, this experimentation. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Jordi. Thank you, everybody, for being with us. It's extremely exciting for us to be connected with such a huge network of city and organization all scattered around the world. Um, my name is uh, Valerio Del Ballivo. I'm part of Orchestra of Transformation curatorial team. And today my role will be simply to introduce you to the overall framework of the project. Um, and to speak about what, what is the Orchestras of Transformation. But briefly, the Orchestras of Transformation is a project that combines contemporary artistic imagination with new action strategy for achieving the SDG objective of the 2030 Agenda. It was in fact initiated uh, in, on the occasion of the 2020 Rome Charter launch and it's commissioned by Azienda Speciale Pala Expo in Rome. Uh, the project invites three international artists um, and curator uh, from cooking section to Jasmine Pateya to Joanna Africo to rethink artistic methods of intervention in the public sphere to implement paths of change and promote alternative imaginaries. For the first edition uh, of orchestras, which will be somehow held uh, between uh, you know, the online world and the city of Rome, the themes of gender-based violence, the theme of regenerative action for the climate crisis and underwater life, and the theme of overcoming of social inequality are at the center of our action. Uh, what we have done, very simple, starting from ongoing research and project, each artist, Jasmine, again, Jasmine, Joanne, and Cookie Section, uh, has chosen to address a different SDG goal, working towards the implementation of new form of awareness and generating new learning paths of urgent issues. Briefly, Indian artist Jasmine Pateja chose SDG number five, gender equality, and in collaboration with feminists and LGBT uh, BQI class association in Rome and in India, where she comes from, she will de develop a podcast campaign to reflect on the theme of gender-based violence. Cultural 
activist and curator, Joanna Africo from Rome, we will work on an artistic palimpsest for the city of Rome connected to the international plural debate attuned to African diaspora with an attention to cultural scene of Afro, Afro descendants. She chose the SDG number 10, the reducing inequalities. And last but not least, we have the lucky to have with us today cooking section who will work on SDG 2, achieving food security and better nutrition, SDG 13, acting for the climate, SDG 14, life underwater. Together with the orchestra, Cook and Alan and Daniel will conduct a multi-form media campaign to raise awareness on the negative impact of food consumption and climate change, titled Becoming Climate War. I wanted to say that uh, uh, our role has uh, an agency, the Orchestra of Transformation, is exactly to somehow let artistic projects interact with policy making for a, dialogue, for a dialogue that shapes social change. Our role is to mediate between art and policy making to rethink cultural inclusion as a political engine for social transformation through art. And so this is the first chapter, but we hope that we would continue this uh, very exciting uh, uh, path through uh, the relation between art and social change. It's just uh, really uh, an NLO from an airport, so I don't want to take too much uh, space uh, and let the uh, cooking section really get into the workshop. I'm just, uh, I just want to add that we're very excited to really be able to bridge, uh, let's say, the imageries that artists are shaping this, in this uh, last decade, because like cooking section, uh, Joanne and Jasmine as uh, Valeria has already explained that they're all working already on these projects for many years. And for us, it was a pleasure to invite them to bridge them towards uh, other constituencies of society in order to really turn these projects into even more effective, even more impactful uh, ideas and actions. So that's, that's uh, our privilege uh, as orchestras to really orchestrate this kind of transformation by bridging art with many other fields. And today, specifically with the uh, people involved in the policy making uh, uh, activities around uh, the cities that are uh, with us today. So I, having said that, I want to thank again, Carla, Jordi, Cesare, and everybody, Francesca, and everybody that has worked to make this happen today. And I let uh, the floor to Valerio for the final introduction, and then we finally get into the workshop. So enjoy the day and uh, hopefully speak to you very soon. Thank you, Matteo. I just will read very briefly our cooking section biography. Cooking section, Daniel Fernandez Pasquale and Alan Chabe is an artistic duo living and working in London. The duo was created to explore the system that organized our contemporary society through food. Using installation, performancing, mapping and video, their research practice explored the boundary between visual art, architecture, ecology, and geopolitics. The, the list of, of exhibitions they participated in is very long. I will just jump uh, uh, through it. Their work has been exhibited at Tate Britain, at Salt in Istanbul, in many different Biennale, such as the 58 Venice Biennale, 13 Shanghai Biennale, 19 Los Angeles Public Art Triennale, 19 Sharia Architecture Triennale, Manifesto 12 Palermo, and so on, so on. I think it's important to say that it's, uh, their next commission will be for the P5 New Orleans Triennial, and they are part of British art show number nine. They teach at Royal College of Art and very recently, and this is fantastic news, that has been uh, shortlisted for the 2021 Turner Prize, the prize for art organized by Tate. Alan and Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining us here today. It's really exciting to be speaking to all of you coming in from many different parts of the world and many different geographies and kind of to think together what is the kind of how this climate kind of change is affecting lives of many people all around the globe. And today we are going to kind of open up um, a process that we are very hopeful we can kind of join like start walking on together 
around the long-term projects that we call Climavore. And Climavore basically questions how we eat as humans are changing the climate. And more so in this context to try and understand how cities and its citizens can be adapting our foods, our diets and our infra food infrastructure to the climate emergency. So really this is kind of the, what is at heart of it, at the heart of Climavore, that today we cannot think so much about the food system and its seasonality through these kind of notions of perhaps winter or spring or summer, but we need to start kind of thinking of the new periods that are emerging, that are responding or kind of the, how the environment is changing according to these new phenomena. Um, so today we'll be presenting briefly three projects. One relates to a response to the certification in the Emirates. Another one is the period of drought in Sicily and another one is fish, fish farm pollution in Scotland. And in all of these cases, it's really kind of to start thinking how cities can start changing the urban environment and the urban landscape and the spaces of where people produce and consume food in order to kind of create spaces that build and kind of change the environment for the better. So in this project in the United Arab Emirates, in, for decades, urbanization has turned cities like Dubai or Sharjah with their back to the desert. The desire to make the desert green resulted in urban landscape made out of sprawling lawns and flower patches and made really the desert to be seen as a space that is unproductive. Um, but if, yeah, if, if, if we start thinking about other responses to the desert, could we start observing how people have lived with the desert for millennia and also teach us how the desert perhaps can be a thriving environment where human landscaping in the city also enables thriving communities. So to address questions around uh, aridity or productivity or food production in one of the hottest uh, regions in the world, what we did was to develop a desert garden uh, to water without water which consisted in a series of microclimates. Um, and for that, we also worked with local agronomists to propagate desert plants that are foods but are not grown commercially in, in that region. So in this project, as you can see here on your right, we basically created these series of microclimates that were using kind of techniques to create condensation and basically attract or absorb water that was kind of accumulating in the air as a way to kind of support the flourishing of different plants that do not need um, excessive amounts of water like green lots. In parallel with that, in kind of in a similar vein, in, we developed a project also in Italy, in Palermo, down in, Sic in the island of Sicily, that has looked into the history of water and the use of water um, in a place that is kind of extremely arid and is an island that sits kind of in the middle of the Mediterranean between North Africa and Southern Europe. So there what we were looking is into these ancient structures like the one on your left, which are gardens to grow citrus and just is a thick drywall that um, makes water condense and in a way it waters with the stones. And based on that kind of traditional system, as you can see here, that accumulates that humidity uh, we develop different microclimates throughout the city in collaboration with scientists from the University in, of Palermo in Sicily uh, and, and reduce water stress from orange trees and use sensors to, to monitor how much they were improving their microclimate and also collaborated with restaurants in, in Palermo in the city to also serve uh, drought foods or, or different ingredients that do not need water for irrigation. So Climavore works with communities, cultural institutions, towns and cities to develop alternative and regenerative food infrastructures for the climate emergency. Today, kind of also we have focused on another project that we've been doing on the Isle of Skye in Scotland where we have been working for the past five years. And there the story starts, um, perhaps quite surprisingly, with a sparrow, a little bird that had turned sun. So when we visited the sky for the first time, that was the story that captivated our minds, how a bird had turned pink. Um, and it was peculiar, but perhaps not that surprising because the sky is home to 
10,000 human residents, but also almost 16 million uh, salmon that are farmed in, in, in cylindrical open nets. So this is the tool that the industry uses to add artificial color to farm salmon so that it can match our color expectations. And this kind of industry today and the salmon farm tool is basically allowed industrial farms to grow um, and to populate many like regions and geographies that span from Chile to Iceland, to Scotland, to Tasmania um, and North America. And in this process, basically farmed salmon are being enclosed in pens um, where one to 200,000 fish are swimming in circles. And they also feed on pellets that contain antibiotics um, that escape through the holes and kind of, and many, and like tons and tons of excrements that suffocate the seabed and creating dead zones. And these salmon farms, um, not only that, and, and I think this is something that is really interesting also for us to discuss today and in the following workshop in two weeks. Also, these farms are for the feed or what the salmon eat are dependent on many different geographies um, to produce soy protein um, that is kind of depleting the Cerrado savanna in the Amazon or kind of many, like many or very vast territories in Argentina and also kind of using like anchovies that are being trolled in West Africa and off the coast of Peru. Um, <clears throat> so the fact that a lot of salmon swim in close proximity is the like the well-known problem of industrial scale food production and you have all kinds of parasites like sea lice and diseases and that's also why there's even more antibiotics that are put uh, to try to, to address it. So what we've been doing as part of that is that like we're trying to look at, at practices that do not produce that excess of um, almost like pollutants in the water, uh, but look at other creatures that filter water by breathing, like oysters, mussels, or also a lot of seaweeds. And one oyster can filter up to 120 liters of seawater per day, as you can see here in the water tanks at the bottom, with oysters and without oysters, uh, it's quite graphic. And, and for us, they, they all provide also an incredible source of easy access protein without any need for feed or, or fertilizer. And after um, many of the natural oyster beds have been depleted, for instance, in the UK, um, it was discovered that the oysters can be grown um, in tables. And on the Isle of Skye, one of the first actions that we did is build an oyster table, which is basically a home for oysters, mussels, and seaweeds that all filter the water as they grow. And this table that kind of at high tide um, acts as a filtering device, at low tide um, emerges out of the water and became a platform for a public discussion about the future of food production and consumption around the island. And into that space, we brought local politicians residents and various community groups basically to have these conversations and to ask these questions of like how does a community respond to a changing climate and to a changing environment so <clears throat> as part of that what we've been doing over the past like six years is to co collaborate a lot with restaurants in the different cities where the climate for project has taken place uh, because for us, restaurants, though you can go back almost to the origins of the word in France in the 17th century, where it was a place called Bouillon Restaurant, or a place to restore the human body with a hot soup, right, as a comfort food. Uh, and, and how can we use the restaurant today as a place to restore not only the human body, but also ecology at large? And, and that's for us a, a key uh, player in kind of reinventing or reimagining the future of food in the city. So Climavore kind of works basically with restaurants to develop menus and kind of food offerings that are regenerative and are kind of not only nu like providing nutrients to the human body, but also kind of building habitats and ecology in the landscape. Um, as part of that kind of process, we also worked for the past year and a half with Tate Britain um, and Tate Museums, which is the National Museum um, in uh, Britain that has four sites in three different cities across the country, basically to remove salmon off its menu and introduce a climb of dish instead, which is made out of different kinds of seaweeds 
and oysters or mussels according to the time of the year. Um, this is also a collaboration that we've been carrying out with many restaurants in Sky, and but also beyond Sky. And each one has been replacing farmed salmon with some of these climate for ingredients, again, like those that uh, filter the water uh, as they breathe or as they grow. And uh, as part of that commitment, Tate has also included climate for dishes across its four restaurants uh, that we are very excited about. Um, Following that, I think Climate 4, basically the methodology that we use is, and kind of this is something that we will be discussing quite a lot um, in our next session, is these kind of three aspects um, that constitute the Climate 4 agenda and the way it operates and kind of the various ways through which we can collaborate. Climate 4 learning, Climate 4 growing, and Climate 4 building. And these are kind of as part of Climate 4 learning that we will start with. We run educational programs where we basically train the future citizens of the world to either become climavore cooks and kind of teach them about kind of regenerative forms of food production and, and how to use various ingredients um, that respond to the different geography or the different city where they live and where they work. Climavore growing that is developing um, agricultural and aquaculture systems that are regenerative, like here in the case of Sky, where we have started recently a farm, um, which is intertidal and polyculture, meaning that it exists between land and sea and the space that is kind of being every day washed by the tides. And that is growing foods that are all kind of have this filtering capacity. So they basically, not only provide a great source of nutrients and protein, but actually take an active role in kind of supporting a very important habitat for many different creatures. And then Climb Over Building is the third branch of the Climb Over project. Uh, and there we are working with also restaurants again that remove farmed salmon and introduce Climb Over dishes to also collect their seashell waste uh, because it's a very valuable material and in Sky and many other places, a big challenge in terms of like, what do you do with all these kind of food waste. Uh, so these are the first prototypes we started developing with crushed shells from oysters, mussels and clams uh, and trying to think of that also as an alternative economy for the island or other places, especially for coastal communities if we are talking about transitioning from fish farms into other forms of regenerative aquaculture. And this has a long history, as you, many of you might know, and we've been looking at international case studies from China to Turkey to Japan to other places where shells have been used as a building material already, just like, as you can see them, like in facades or as decorative uh, components. Uh, but also how can we imagine these new composites uh, that can be also applied to the construction industry? So in this kind of prospect, I think what we will be asking in today and in the next section is how can cities become climavore? And through these kind of different aspects of learning, building and growing, and also using kind of art institutions for kind of cultural activity and, and at the same time, using restaurants as site for this ecological restoration, we can kind of start exploring how each city can be adapt um, its action and its way of work and its agenda to kind of these questions of food, food security, food justice um, in this era of rapid environmental transformation. And at the same time, also kind of, uh, as we kind of have a discussion, we can share also some more examples from other um, geographies and other kind of cities that have been engaged um, in similar, 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 similar activities. Thank you, Daniel and Alan. Uh, thank you very much for sharing the stories. And um, and I'm sure that there are, there is more to invent. And uh, I, I was just curious about the com. Um, I've been. I'm sorry. I lost. <laughs> I lost the the, the 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 intervention actually of Joan from Concepcion that actually was uh, intervening to to support this um, uh, the theory. So maybe as as a way of breaking the ice a little and kick off questions because the the issue that we have at hand is pretty big. But maybe Joan, do you wish to share a little bit more about this experience in your community? Yeah. Yes, thank you, Carla. Uh, good morning. Uh, here is 
early in the morning in Chile. Um, well, I come, I, I live in Concepcion, but I am from the Chile island. The salmon farming industry has completely destroyed our marine environment, our traditional form of food production, and also the, the cultural relationships between the older generations with their sustainable agriculture practices. And now uh, most of the young people are working for, for the salmon farming industry with low wages, with uh, also a big deal of acculturation. And we're losing some of our, not just our uh, way of life, but also our perspective of future for the new generations as they are being condemned uh, to the poverty of an extractivist industrial pardon and we are fighting this now, but the political crisis that we are experiencing today also leaves us with little room for discussion and for fighting this back. So culture is being yet now in Chile, the, the main arena of political discussion. So I find that the cooking sections experience is very valuable to us because gives us um, a way of going forward to fight this salmon farming industry. Also the, the, the other forms of extractivism that are hitting us today. So I, I, I want to thank them and, and to thank you for inviting us to this session today. And I'm wishing also to share your experience with my people because it will be of a very high value to us to, to address this, not just uh, fighting the salmon farm industry, but also raising the awareness of uh, the food uh, sector, the, the tourism sector, that the, the restaurants, also the, the people who lives off the, the fishing industry and the uh, many, many, many people that are looking for a way to a sustainable future here. So I, I wish to thank you for that. What is your experience in dealing with uh, uh, with administrations or institutions? Is there anything that has been uh, uh, that have you learned that you wish to share? Yeah, no, I think it's a wonderful question, and I think to give an example, I mean, you cannot compare uh, compare Tate museums to uh, the city of Rome or any other city in terms of kind of the scale of the institution, but still being one of the largest museums in the world, um, working with them and kind of seeing how one could implement change and what the role of the big institution can have um, in kind of rolling out and, and being a leader of change. I think that is kind of a really um, has been a very kind of successful experience. And I think at the same time, there are many other kind of examples and we can just very quickly um, share again the screen just to kind of give a couple of visuals to that. Um, so in the Cayman Islands, in, which is an island in, in the middle, like between the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico, um, in, a number kind of over the past years, there has been a kind of, taken over, like the marine environment has been taken over by lionfish. And lionfish were kind of a fish that is non-native to that area and has been kind of eating a lot of other fish and kind of threatening the ecology. And I think what for us was really interesting in that example, that the kind of government of the Cayman Islands through the Ministry of the Environment kind of declared the lionfish as a national dish, oh, almost as a national dish and kind of encouraged um, citizens to go and fish for it um, in a process that is quite complicated and worked with chefs to introduce it into restaurants and kind of really created competitions, uh, and, competitions tournaments. and tournaments and, and kind of to really kind of understand that kind of how do we kind of change our culture and I think this is one of the things that governments do can have a huge role today in these questions around in climate change and kind of change of the environment is to understand that, you know, cultural heritage is an extremely important thing that we need to work on preserving and respecting. But at the same time, we also really have to think how we adapt our ways to an environment that is changing and kind of these two things 
how could we use kind of our cultural heritage in order to think about the future? I think it's something that the go- like various kind of governments and municipalities can play a very important role in. What what have you imagined in for in in in, in big lines about uh, the the processes that you wish to initiate with cities that or organizations that want to engage into this opportunity that uh, orchestras is uh, is offering to this uh, network and this community? Yeah. So for us, it's an incredible opportunity to be in discussion with this all these all of you representatives of different kind of very different uh, landscapes and, and climatic conditions and for us w- the way we see also climate war is a, a framework that can support some of these conversations and, and ways of imagining the future uh, right because like we know there is a crisis it's obvious and and there's no single answer uh, but like, we are very excited about posing more questions and then think about okay do we have now is this are we experiencing a, a new season of drought or desertification could we shift the food production perhaps towards um, orchards that do not need water and, and rescue some of the old ingredients from that particular geography that actually have been growing there without irrigation for hundreds of years right so connecting the kind of ancestral techniques with ancient ingredients, but also very much needed today. And, and at the same time, and, and I think these are all strategies that kind of will be using the workshop to kind of, on the one hand, start identifying what are the urgent questions that cities are asking themselves in relation to kind of the climate crisis. And then at the same time, how can we kind of also cities can become like mobilizers of like a movement kind of, or join and support different kind of movements that are already happening and kind of try basically to link together their businesses, activists or community groups and cultural organizations and cultural institutions to basically be working together to advance these questions. Because I think as in, I think everyone is well aware, the questions around climate and environmental transformation are extremely big and extremely complex and they, ch- they touch us on so many kind of levels and registers and many times I think it's it's almost hard to think you know like where does one start you know how does the city start tackling like all of these questions but I think I think one of the things that we really try to do with Climavore is kind of build a consortium and I think this is also what is really potent and beautiful about kind of UCLG that it kind of really brings I think expertise and experience from all over the world and kind of it enables also to share a perspective on a global scale, not only kind of, and to see kind of these questions both as a hyper-local question and challenge, but at the same time that it's part of a much larger global movement. I, I drag into Jordi, how do you see it as a, in your uh, view, a big view among the cities of the network? Where is the conversation going in this sense, if there is any? Of course there is, of course there is, because uh, the fact that uh, there are several targets that uh, address this this question uh, in SDG 13, in SDG 12, uh, oblige uh, civil society and, and of course local governments and mainly national governments, but uh we know that national governments are uh say machines that are uh, heavy and uh have sometimes uh say difficulties in 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 going down to a specific local uh situations but anyway all kind of actors and uh, all over the world are considering these these issues the 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 gap is in the in the cultural sector um, be, because we were not empowered by the SDGs, I, 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 am, I keep recalling that we do not have a cultural goal, and it is uh, this is a trouble not only for say our uh, obvious activity, but also because it disconnects us from becoming uh, a, a, a real partner in many endeavors. But okay, we accept that that frame. We we know that we have to struggle more to be more convincing. And we have to take opportunity to, to work locally, nationally, internationally with what we have. 
Um, I, 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 I think that uh, almost all cities uh, with which we, we work uh, have similar situations to the ones uh, described by our colleagues of uh, Climavor. Um, perhaps they are not as explicit as now they, they, they explain it, um, but, but uh, all cities have a concern for uh, uh, not damaging more the, the relation between uh, the humans and the environment. Uh, trying to create uh, circles of proximity in consumption and production, uh, being loyal to the to the to the products that grow, uh, say w with with uh, low human intervention, or with uh, long term human intervention that has uh, not damaged the 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 environment. Um, I think that this is this is happening everywhere. Again, uh, but not always with a strong uh, artistic uh, intervention as the ones that uh, the cooking section uh, have been promoting with climate war. Professor Shin, what do you say? Because I I know that you have been. What do you see in Korea? So uh, one of the big issues. Uh, in Korea, we are trying to make the food production as cheap as possible, as economical as possible, which means we invest, we put into more energy to produce more efficiently. And then uh, the Jordi mentioned the seasonal uh, food, but even in winter time, we use greenhouse, which is quite a lot energy consuming. So that kind of artificial instead of traditional agriculture or aquaculture, we spend more energy harming, uh, producing more gases, but more economical for the, to the farmers. That is one of the main issues in Korea. Another one is you mentioned about the food chain, food production and the consumption, the distance. So local food is more ex expensive than food imported. That's why people consume more foods which come from a long distance, costing a lot, not, not, not in terms of money, but in terms of gas production, CO2 production. So that is the major problem in Korea. So the industrial development, the people have more money in pocket, but still they are not very much concerned about crime of war. So personally, it is new concept, crime of war. So uh, this kind of forum convention conferences will help people to be more conscious about energy consumption, CO2 production. Uh, so, uh, but still, uh, and then another one I want to mention is that this kind of movement should be uh, mobilize should should be uh, make them should make the most of civil society without civil society as a medium the people are quite difficult to be mobilized so civil society in korea civil society movements are very strong but they are mostly concerned about environment in general human rights, democracy, but not much on crime of war. So uh, hope we can have more civil society organizations to push forward with this issue. In addition to like a gender equality, for example, the gender movement is very strong now in Korea, but uh, so we have to mobilize more citizens to participate 
in this, this kind of movement through organizations. Without organizational channel, people are quite difficult to be mobilized. Thank you, Professor Shin. While, while uh, interesting point of view. <laughs> and while I, I maybe invite uh, uh, Ms. Klimene Christoforou, if she wished to share a point of view about what she was saying about an environmental platform, I'm just sharing with you all a question from our friend from the UNSDG agency from Bonn that is writing into the chat. My question to you and to all participants, of course, would be how do we make sure that local actions tailored for specific local needs can build into a global thread with global impact? I think it's a, it's a, it's a question that we can start discussing today, but I'm sure we're going to take it to June 30th. But, um, uh, Klimeni, you have many experiences. You have England, you have Cyprus. So what would you wish to share with us? Hello, everybody. How, um, I'm honoured to be part of this, this group today. How lovely to hear, to hear this project particularly. Thank you. Um, yes, I've been working with UCLG on the Pilot Cities programme, specifically with the city of Leeds, but also with the city of Elefsina. And I had a couple of thoughts I'd like to, to come in on. The first is within the city of Leeds is this thinking about how we share good practice. You know, we have small examples and often if we're thinking about processes which are circular or regenerative, they're often working on quite a small scale. It's not the big institutions that are doing this. So how do we share the knowledge that we are gaining in these tiny corners of the world or of our cities with a wider group? And, and Leeds have a very interesting platform where it brings together the cultural sector called Sustainable Arts in Leeds. And this has been operating for quite a time and it brings in a whole range of cultural organisations and actors to discuss specific issues, including how we kind of measure our success in terms of our impact on Carbon, carbon footprint. So I think how we share this knowledge is important at a local level, as well as part of these fantastic international forums. The other one I wanted to touch on really quickly is uh, we partner currently with an organization in Cyprus called the Sadkis Festival. It's, it's absolutely tiny, and I'll put a link in the chat. It's a tiny festival, but the principle of it is addressing this notion of international festivals and how we have this circus of artists traveling, doing something with a big statement and then going away and doing it somewhere else. So how do we address the very local? And this festival in Cyprus works over a long period of time, over a year, connecting to the growers of remote villages. So thinking very much about everything in this notion of the circular economy from the food production angle of what it is that's the culture of that particular place. So addressing the climate change actually through the lack of water on the hazelnut uh, production this year or how the dates are, are or are not able to be dried at a local level and actually working with those very traditional techniques as part of their audience development program. You want to reply we have also a message from Bogota in the chat that says, hi everyone from the mayor's office of Bogota. We work on projects that seek food safety and a sustainable food supply chain. Among the activities we have this year, we will implement a project with 260 restaurants and a thousand mini stores sharing healthy eating practices. Daniel, Aaron. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for all of these comments. I think they're really excellent resources and, and I think it's, it's exactly those initiatives that I think by kind of bringing them into this forum and kind of discussing them and at the same time identifying what are the challenges that different cities are facing perhaps can kind of develop into kind of new approaches and new projects that could be kind of long lasting and kind of complement a lot of the work that is, is taking place. And, and, and it's very encouraging to see that kind of these questions are already being discussed and kind of being thought on kind of many kind of different levels. And, and perhaps, yeah, this is an opportunity kind of to advance the discussion even further. Just giving a bit of an overall framework about Climavore and kind of the different approaches that it takes. I think we are going to send kind of a few more prompts and questions towards in June 30th that you should expect to receive in, in the coming days. 
that would basically enable us to have kind of much more specific conversations and kind of workshop some of these ideas and challenges and how kind of crime of war perhaps could become a lens or a tool to start kind of asking these questions and and from there kind of develop kind of see how we could develop a relationship um, to kind of actually advance this uh, questions into projects that could be um, implemented in the future. And uh, I want to thank um, everybody. Uh, I want to thank Jordi and UCLG team for this, uh, how can I say, joint uh, venture. <laughs> really like this. This is something new. We are all in this together and it's very interesting um, if we can keep working on this together because our collective intelligence will bring more answers than we expect. This is what we also hope with the Rome Charter. That's how the Rome Charter was born and that's what we hope will continue being in the next future.